20% of the greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change are due to tropical deforestation. It's more than all the transportation in the world put together. If we could just make trees worth more alive than dead, it's the easiest way to reduce greenhouse gas reductions. These were the words of Rebecca Moore on this stage just a couple of years ago um, from Google Earth Outreach. She and her team had recently begun working with the Amazon Surui tribe to halt the decimation of their traditional rainforest lands in Brazil. The collaboration started when Chief Almir arrived on the doorstep of the Googleplex to ask for the technological tools to save his people and their homelands. Rebecca and her team went to the Amazon and taught people who had never before used a computer how to use Google Earth technology. When the Surui integrated their closely observed cultural maps with the satellite technology of Google Earth, they began transmitting an invaluable biocultural legacy to young tribal members and made their vanishing rainforest and endangered culture, culture visible to the world. Tribal members now patrol the rainforest armed with GPS-equipped cell phones, gathering irrefutable evidence to share with the potential half a billion Google Earth users all over the world. Their partner, the Amazon Conservation Team, has now used a participatory strategy with 19 other tribes, indigenous tribes in the Amazon, to map more than 40 million acres of rainforest across South America. In most cases, the maps have legal standing. The Surui have now created a 50-year plan and model of sustainable development. Their reforestation initiative, the Surui Carbon Red Program, will help mitigate climate change while ensuring a sustainable source of income for the protection of their forests. It provides a tangible case study to inform discussions and practices around payments for ecosystem services and indigenous and state rights. The Surui are the first tribe who will be paid for replanting and protecting forests for making trees worth more alive than dead. And as a result of that success, the attempts to assassinate Chief Almir have intensified. It's extremely serious. In recent times, 11 Surui tribal chiefs have been assassinated for resisting illegal logging. So this is the kind of case study that highlights the vision and values of Rebecca Moore. Rebecca's a computer scientist and longtime software professional. She got her cyber mapping start when she hit on groundbreaking new uses to, to use the then new Google Earth mapping tools. She helped, um, she stopped the logging of more than a thousand acres of redwoods in her own Santa Cruz Mountains community. When Google saw the extraordinary potential for social good, the company hired her to conceive and lead the Google Earth Outreach Program. It now supports nonprofits, communities, and indigenous peoples in applying Google's mapping tools to the world's pressing problems in areas including environmental conservation, human rights, and creating a sustainable society. Rebecca continues to work with the Surui on new cutting edge international programs to save their forests, as well as with a very wide range of organizations all over the world from stopping mountaintop removal in Appalachian call country to UN, yeah. <laughs> to UN relief agencies and NGOs assisting flood victims in, in Pakistan and earthquake survivors in Haiti. Rebecca also leads the development of Google Engine, a new technology platform that facilitates global scale monitoring and real-time measurement of changes in the Earth's environment. It enables scientists to use the Google Cloud to analyze this imagery and apply it to countless societal challenges. Just as Rebecca has joined virtual forces from outer space with Chief Almir and many others to visualize a future environment of hope, she's also opening our eyes and hearts here on Earth. Please join me in welcoming a visionary of visualization, Rebecca Moore. Hello, Bioneers. It's great to be back here. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kenny and Nina because I started all this work as a, I'd love to say young activist, but let's just say an activist in 2005. And uh, 
every step of the way, Bioneers has been really supportive of my work. They gave me the chance to be on a panel, and then to have a workshop, and then a plenary. And uh, I've traveled now all over the world. I've gone to international climate change conferences and spoken there. I've been to Africa and Indonesia, all over South America. And I have to say, there's no place like home. Bioneers is my favorite conference. So let's put on the visuals, speaking of visualization. All right. I have to start by sort of getting the planet moving a little bit here. Sort of not quite the right axis, but you get the idea. So Kenny asked me to think this time about, you know, of giving you a Google Earth Eye view and how a Google Earth Eye view has changed me. And so that's what I'm going to do. Some of the things I'm going to show you, if you've seen me present before, will be a little bit of a repeat, but it's never the same each time. But then I'm also going to talk about a bunch of new work that I and my team are doing. So let's start with giving you a Google Earth Eye view. Where are we right now? One reason I like to start with this is a lot, I have found, one of the things I've learned, <laughs> yeah. By the way, the parking lot's more full today than when this uh, satellite image was taken. But one of the most basic things I've learned is seeing is believing. And many of the environmental challenges, many of the debates between all these stakeholders who want to kill them, you know, kill each other, often comes down to they just don't have the basic facts. They don't agree on the basic elements of what's happening on the ground. And so by dispelling a level of ignorance, just showing people what's happening, you can elevate the nature of the dialogue and towards creating solutions. So let's, let me give you an example of something. This is very simple. I've never actually shown this before. I just found it this morning. I did a, a Google search on monarch migration. I wanted to see if anybody had done anything with that. And I found that there was an elementary school in, in Minnesota that created a Google Earth visualization of the monarch migration, which is sort of one of the most cool migrations that citizen scientists, kids follow all over, all over uh, the country. And you may know that the monarchs that migrate south for the winter that are east of the Rockies overwinter in Mexico. I grew up learning that from when I was a kid. They go to Mexico, right? So you imagine they have like this big place they hang out in Mexico. They're not drinking pina coladas or anything, but anyway, that it, they just have this great place to go. So. I, I looked this morning at, you know, they've mapped where monarchs were sighted going south and going north. This is actually where they see them up at the school. So each one of these is where, you know, the school's right here. Each one of these is where uh, sightings have been made. So let's go down and visit them where they're sighted in Mexico. So this is actually, believe it or not, a protected area. It's recognized as a UNESCO biosphere reserve. And this looks pretty good, right? They have nice forest. But if you just widen your view a little bit, you see what's really going on in this area. Tremendous amount of deforestation. Tremendous amount of logging. Backing out a little bit, all those butterflies this is their whole thing they have to work with. So I don't know about what it does for you, but for me when I saw that, it was sort of shocking, sort of eye-opening, and gave me a sense of really these places you hear about, oh, they go to Mexico, right? They're really very vulnerable, special, fragile places, and we need to do a better job protecting them. There are activists on the ground now that are actually using Google Earth to protect and, and stop the kind of logging that's happening here and do reforestation projects. Let me show you another example of hope. So people are now making actually fundamental discoveries about the planet using Google Earth. There's a coral reef specialist in Western Australia who works for their um, Department of Environment and Conservation. And there was a proposal to uh, do oil and gas exploration in this region. But 
he himself has become an aficionado of Google Earth. And every time we get new imagery, which by the way, you can register a place on the planet that you want to know when we get new imagery, and we'll email you. Um, he noticed one day this new imagery. And as a specialist, he understood this is actually a fringing coral reef that is fed by fresh water. They're very rare. No one had even known that it exists. And as a result of this, uh, let, let me show you this. This is sort of funny. His, uh, his name is Chris Simpson. It was uh, written up in the paper. And he said, um, I feel like uh, a bloody desktop Darwin making this discovery. <laughs> but what's you know, significant about it is uh, they were about to start oil and gas exploration because people didn't know enough about this area to know that this reef existed. And now it's being considered for permanent protection as a marine uh, protected area. So you guys, I, I have to give you my activist start. Uh, and I apologize if you've seen it before, but this is, this is to establish my street cred with you guys. So it all started, I mentioned it started in 2005 when um, my neighbors and I, I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains above Los Gatos, just, yeah, beautiful place. And um, one day I opened the mail, I had this little document in the mail and so did all my neighbors. And it's, what does it say? Hmm, notice of intent to harvest timber. Hmm, that did not sound good. And then, okay, legend. Okay, this is helpful. The black lines mean non-industrial timber management plan area. Huh, black lines. Gee, that's really clear. <laughs> Topo lines, roads, I mean, nobody understood this. And guess what? Maybe that was on purpose. And most people simply threw it out, right? But it sort of bugged me. And uh, we were having a community, uh, like an emergency community meeting. 300 of my neighbors and I you know, were going to get together and share information. What do you know about this thing? And so I decided over that weekend, I was going to study this thing like crazy and extract the elements of what they were proposing to do and remap it in full 3D satellite imagery on Google Earth. So that's what I did. So what were they planning to do with that black and white notice of intent to harvest timber? Well, here it is. It turns out this area in red is what they're proposing to log. It's a six mile swath of more than 1,000 acres along the Los Gatos Creek watershed. Not good. So then to really drive it home, and again, this was one thing to understand is this was uh, August, September 2005. Google Earth had just come out in June of 2005. Up until that point, most people were kind of using it to fly to their home, figure out where to go on vacation, where to go backpacking, which I use it for too. But no one had really used it for environmental grassroots advocacy. But somehow I stumbled into, into doing that. So let me show you. I took the elements of the plan, as I mentioned, and created using, and this is pretty, crude, actually, compared to what you can do now. In fact, let me turn, yeah. Um, I created this virtual flight up the Los Gatos Creek Canyon to show people. And basically, you can see how close it is to these densely populated communities. You can see how this is the drinking watershed for 100,000 people in Silicon Valley and my neighbors and I. Because the land is so steep, they can't take the logs out by roads, so they were going to do it by helicopter. So I mapped all the helicopter landing spots. Originally, I put shopping carts, because basically they're going to turn it into a tree farm. But anyway, I used helicopter icons. Very importantly, it's incredibly, it would be incredibly close to the schools, daycare center, you know, nursery school, and so on. And we'll come, come back to that in a second. But as I think you can probably appreciate, you get a much more a much better picture of the plan with this, quote, Google Earth Eye View. Let me just show you a couple of things. So for example, I also, the land was privately owned by a utility company, but I snuck in there in order to, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
The another thing that I wanted to expose is in the plan they said, oh, we're not going to cut any old growth redwoods, which by the way, they didn't use the word old growth because that's so inflammatory to people. They said late successional forest, right? <laughs> But, oh, by the way, in fine print, on page like 450, they said, we will cut defective trees. So I'm like, what's a defective tree? So again, like page 839, you know, in tiny font, a defective tree is any tree that has a split top. Well, right. So, and, you know, my neighbors and I who live there know that much of the forest that old growth forest that's left actually has a split top because the area was logged in the 1800s and then after the 1906 earthquake and the loggers at that time took the single trunked trees because that's where you get the most timber and they left behind these trees. These trees, they've been struck by lightning, they made it through earthquakes, they're like over a thousand years old. It would be like saying your grandmother's defective because she has wrinkles. <laughs> so. I, so I was like, but let's bring reality to this. So I went and took photographs of these so-called defective trees that they would cut and, you know, took a photo of my friend standing next to it. Again, this is a very simplistic thing, uh, of a way of using Google Earth. Anyone can do this very easily. If you go to our Google Earth outreach site, we have tutorials on how to do this, earth.google.com slash outreach. You can do much more sophisticated things now. But I did this, like I said, in a weekend. So long story short, because uh, I, I could go on about this forever. Um, ultimately, using Google Earth, and there was a battle, and they tried to say Google Earth is an illegitimate tool, and anyway, long story short, using Google Earth, we were able to prove that it was not only a bad idea, but that legally it did not qualify. And as a result, uh, the plan was ruled ineligible. I do just have to show you, uh, we called ourselves Neighbors Against Irresponsible Logging, or NAIL, and Charlie the Beaver was our mascot. My neighbor took this because he's a res beavers are responsible loggers, right? All right. <laughs> They're not greedy. Um, I want to show you, I'm going to do this one really fast. Uh, Kenny mentioned Appalachian Voices, so the mountaintop removal issue. Um, Shortly after a lot of press came out around this using Google Earth to save the logging, stop the, stop the logging, I got a phone call. Hey, Rebecca, this is Woody. I'm like, Woody? Woody Harrelson? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Woody. It's a really bad imitation. Uh, do you think we could do what you did to stop the redwood logging? We could stop blowing up mountains in Appalachia. They've blown up more than 400 mountains, and nobody knows what's going on. You can only see it from the air, right? So these grassroots organizations that have no political power, right, they would raise money for like a year to fly one politician over in a plane so they could see what was happening with mountaintop removal. Um, and so I said, sure, we will help you. Um, I'm going to give you just a quick example of how we taught them to annotate Google Earth to tell the story, for example, of egregious mining operations. Here, for example, is after the mountains are blown up and all the toxic debris is dumped into the river, the mining company claims that they remediate the landscape and they restore the river, right? And this is an example of a remediated, restored riverbed. Okay, the river used to be like this, right? Now it's filled with the mountain. This, see this little line here of you know, gravel? That is what they claim to be a restored, healthy riverbed. So what the group did is they said, OK, let's, let's show you what's behind that pretty little veneer of grass, right? Marsh Fork Elementary School. There's an elementary school that is literally right at the base of a huge mining operation. It's right down here. Look at what they've done, right? And there's this sludge impoundment dirt dam. They fail, right? 
They fail, and this is a toxic sludge pool that would come right down on the school. I could go on, but uh, I'm going to stop and just show you one thing here. Here's another dynamited site. Um, they embedded these videos of dynamited mountains. So long story short, once they created this, they'd been trying to get signatures on um, a clean water bill. They had two signatures <laughs> uh, on a petition. Um, when, from the time this launched, within 10 days, they had 13,000 signatures from every state in the US and more than like 30 countries around the world. That, yeah. They used it to lobby in the halls of Congress and show their representatives, and they gained more than 200 congressional representatives' support who themselves blogged about how everyone needs to go look at this in Google Earth, and you will understand why I'm supporting this bill. The Kentucky Coal Company said this was cheating. <laughs> yes, they did. They said the group was using Google Earth for shock value. Yes. And what's great is after that came out in the news, all these people started writing the newspaper saying, yeah, it is shocking. What's shocking is what you're doing, what you're trying to get away with. And thank God we know about it now. All right. We're going to now go visit virtually uh, Chief Elmir Saroui's home. As Kenny mentioned, uh, Chief Elmir heard about the work we were doing and the groups we were supporting, and he came and said, uh, his land is under great threat. And they had been, his father who was chief before him, had been able to drive off illegal invaders of their land since first contact in 1969 using bow and arrow for a while. It wasn't working anymore. Chief Elmir was the first member of his tribe to go to university. And there, he stumbled on Google Earth in an internet cafe. And like the rest of us, the first thing he did was he flew to his home. When he did that, you can see, I hope you can appreciate, how stark it is, right? This boundary is what they are defending. And you can actually see, when you zoom in, the illegal logging incursions into their land, right? So he came and he said, please teach us, first of all, how to put our history and culture on this land. So when people fly around in Google Earth and Maps, they know that people live there and have lived there for many, many generations. And second of all, help us reach partners, right, with, by communicating our story. So that became a project of love. And one of my next lessons I want to mention is cultural mapping. Maps are an expression of culture. They're an expression of culture. No culture will make maps the same way. The icons that you pick for your maps represent what's meaningful to you, what's valuable to you. Whether it's you know, the jaguar that is a sacred animal to the Surui and they tell the story of that, or the sites of historical battles, these are very uniquely meaningful to the Surui. I also learned a new word in Portuguese, socioambiental, social environmental, that you cannot separate people from the environment or the environment from people. You have to consider these issues together. <laughs> After working with the Surui, and we're still working with the Surui, we began uh, to work with the Shingu tribe. And just as another example of maps as an expression of culture, for the for the Wara people, the Shingu Wara people, their entire livelihood is their sustenance comes from the rivers. What's interesting is they, when they mapped what's significant to them, they have five or six different symbols for fishing spot because where, there are places where you fish with a net, there are places where you use a spear, there are places where you use a basket, there are places, you know, and that this is intimately important to them to have these kind of distinctions. And just like linguistically, people talk about, you know, people who live in the north have many words for snow. 
Cultures have many different, uh, there's a rich variety of map symbols depending upon what's important to them. All right, the next point I want to make <laughs> is I've learned things are not so black and white. You know, when I started out as an activist, it was like, they're the good guys and the bad guys, right? They're the people that are defending the world and there are people that are plundering and exploiting and that's just it. Well, it's actually not so black and white. And you guys, I'm sure, know this, but it turns out that the Surawi used to live sustainably on their land. And then when first contact happened and they were invaded and their fruit trees, their nut trees, their fish, their game were taken, they now had to find food. They, had, they needed money. They needed to engage with the outside economy. They had no way to do this. They didn't have job skills. So they themselves, some of them, began to sell their logs, began to be bribed. You can understand why they would do this, right? You need to feed your family. You need to feed your children. I don't fault them for it. And in fact, though, many large environmental NGOs began to propagate a belief that indigenous people were part of the problem in the Amazon, that it's the indigenous people taking their own resources that are the serious issue. Well, let's look at a map here that I think will be eye-opening. These are the indigenous territories in Brazil. Let's look at where the land is protected and where the land is desecrated and clear-cut. We already know about the Surui example, right, which you saw here. But let's go over here. This is another area. Here's the uh, Uruawawau. You can see, again, it's just like the, the Surui. Right at the border of the indigenous territory, it's clear cut. Inside it, it's protected. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs, FANAI, actually brought Chief Almir to President Lula, former President Lula of Brazil, and said, if you want to defend the rainforest in the Amazon, you say you want to protect the rainforest. If you want to do that, you need to support and strengthen the indigenous people. They are the ones that are protecting the forest. So the, uh, the last point, um, visualization is not everything. I hate to admit that, but, uh, <laughs> but these scientists came to us when we were in the Amazon and they said, this is great, we love this, it's very powerful, activists, it's very powerful. But what we really need to do is not just look at this imagery. You have all this imagery going back over time in Google Earth. We need to analyze it. We need to measure deforestation. We need to use that to report statistics and to support a green economy. So long story short, that's what we've done with Earth Engine. We're going to close with a video about how the Surawi are at the bleeding edge of this new Google Earth Engine platform that we've built. Um, I also wanted to mention we're very excited. We're working with a group that Bioneers is supporting, the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. We're working with the youth there. We're uh, doing a training next month for them on how they can map a renewable energy future and get off the fossil fuel oil plants that are there, go to wind and solar using this kind of technology. So let's bring up the DVD. Many people are familiar with Google Earth, and environmental groups are using it today to take people all around the world virtually to places on the planet that are under threat. The Surui tribe is also using Google Earth as a tool based on the training the Google Earth Outreach team did in 2008 when we went down to the Surui territory in the Amazon. We taught them how to put their cultural map information on Google Earth and share their culture with the world. However, now the Surui want to go beyond this. And that's where Google Earth Engine comes in. Para nossa visão indígena Floresta é um único, é uma das, é, uma das é, papel que pode trazer a clima normal. 
gente está trabalhando com, com o projeto Carbono Suruí. Né? Então, oferecer ao mercado o serviço é, que a floresta tem para diminuir o gás de estufa. What you need for what Chief Almir wants is a living, breathing, daily update of the planet. Google Earth was not designed for that. That's what we're building with Google Earth Engine. With Google Earth Engine, we, Google, are focusing on what we do best, which is organizing this information and making it available in a way that's never been possible before because of the scale of the data and the scale of the uh, computational resources required. The SUE Red Carbon Project is one of the most advanced, or is the most advanced in the Amazon today. We're inserting Android handheld devices or telephones into the data collection process for carbon measurement. Because if you're saying you're going to reduce deforestation and in that way reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere, you need to be able to measure or show how much carbon you're really preventing from going into the atmosphere. Para medir uma árvore, você tem que que tamanho de árvore que 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 está sendo que está sendo calculado o carbono lá, né? Então você vai seguindo o formulário que está dentro do equipamento. This is the first project really where the Indians themselves are the ones measuring the carbon and being taught how to do it and they're using this technology. And so the technology allows them to become the carbon monitors. Você pode usar também para é, é, denúncias, né? Se você fazer, se você analisar uma ameaça da a floresta, né, você pode também denunciar isso. Today, if you want to monitor deforestation in the Amazon, it takes weeks to run the analysis. By the time you've done that, the illegal activities are long gone. With Google Earth Engine, you can build a real-time alerting system based on images that are taken that show what the state of the forest was last week, what is it this week. When you see a suspicious change, Chief Almir and the Surawee will be notified. They will go on the ground with the Google Android smartphones and investigate. They will take photographs and videos. They will document what's happening and who's doing it. That will then get uploaded back into Earth Engine for anyone around the world to see the reality of what's happened and then begin to support a law enforcement proceeding. Como tecnologia, como equipamento do Google pode ser importante para para construir um futuro melhor, um futuro que tenha consciência. Como é que as pessoas estão construindo solução para aqueles mais isoladamente, mas precisamos juntar, né? Precisamos pensar em um mundo como fosse nosso de todo mundo, que é, né? And what's important now is to use the power of the internet to bring together all the voices that can participate in a dialogue towards constructive solutions for the planet. That's what we're building with Earth Engine, and we're putting it in the hands of the world. It's going to be a great adventure. Thanks very much. Thank you.